Good morning. My name's Steve Alms and I'm a minister of Bookham Baptist Church. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our morning worship together. Last week we were exploring what it means to find and keep our confidence in God, especially in a time of crisis. In a moment you're going to hear from uh, the Reverend Alan Jenkins, who is the rector of St Nicholas's in, in Bookham. About a week ago, Alan recorded this message for his congregation and it's filled with hope and gets into what it means to trust God in difficult times, going right to the, the teaching of Jesus for our inspiration. After you've listened to this, um, I'm going to tell you a story. It's a light-hearted tale about a trusting heart. It's easy to assume that the future will be like the present, but more so. So declared my Bible study notes this morning. Of course, these notes were written long before coronavirus, and so it's not our present situation to which they were referring. However, it does seem to me that in many ways this sentence encapsulates something of our current crisis. We make plans and get on with life, assuming all will be well, but then something intervenes, and we realise the future is rather less certain and definitely rather less in our control than we may care to admit. This is one area in which being a Christian has certainly helped me. For a start, Christian faith is realistic about the precariousness of life. We are not masters of our own destiny, not at all. Life is, in fact, incredibly fragile. But more encouragingly, even though that is the way life is, we believe in a Heavenly Father who cares for us, and holds us in his hands every moment of every day. And so perhaps we may dare to approach the future with rather less anxiety and fear than would otherwise be the case. This week, the Diocese of Guildford's daily Lent reflections on the theme of keeping things simple have drawn on one of my favourite parts of the Bible, Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount, recorded in Matthew 6. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Of course, Telling someone not to worry about their life is not much use unless the person saying it has a vision of something better, something stronger. Happily, Jesus does, and it is his appreciation of the temporariness of life combined with the Heavenly Father who cares for us even more than he does the birds of the air and the flowers of the field in which our own hope for the future lies. So I've got a story for you. It's a story about a man of simple faith. And we meet him at his kitchen table. He's just about to tuck into a simple meal of bread and ale. The knife goes into the bread and there's a knock at the door. He wasn't expecting anybody. So he went to the door and opened it and there stood a man who looked quite destitute Without a moment's thought, he welcomed him in to his table. He said to the stranger, I haven't got much, but what I have, you're welcome to share. Now we're going to leave William, for that was his name, at the table with the stranger and go back the day before. The afternoon before, in fact. A palace. On top of the palace, a garden where the king is walking. Well, I say walking, more like pacing. For the king's mind was troubled, filled with anxieties. What does a king worry about? Well, he would worry that there might not be enough money in the royal coffers to meet the expenditure of the kingdom. He's worried, he was worried about the possibility of a plague breaking out in his kingdom. Sometimes he would look out and look for his armies returning from battle, wondering if they would be victorious or return defeated. Sometimes he looked around at his courtiers and advisers. He wondered just how loyal they were. They seemed to be, 
But maybe they were talking in the shadows. Maybe they were conspiring against him. Do you see, there's so many things a king might worry about. Now, on this particular afternoon, as the king looked out on his kingdom, he saw the people milling in the, in the market square. And he wondered to himself, do they worry as I worry? Do they live with the anxieties that I live with? Or is this just the burden of royalty? Well, he decided it was time to find out. In that moment, he hatched a cunning plan. He called the royal tailor to bring some rough cloth and instructed him to make some clothes for him. He was pleased with the result and he stood in this very rough outfit. And after he'd gone to the fireplace and smeared his face with soot, looking in the royal mirror, he looked every bit the beggar. The next morning, early, he stole out of the palace and went to the market square. He spent the day listening into conversations. He wanted to pick up how, how it was for people in his kingdom. Did they live so, as anxiously as he did? Well, he did this for the whole of the day. And then in the evening, as he was walking home, he found himself drawn to a particular house, a, a very simple house. There was a, a fire glowing through the window. And as he looked through the window, he could see a man sat at the table, eating a simple meal of bread and ale. There was something about this man that drew him, a serenity that he could pick up even from outside the house. So he knocked the door, was quickly welcomed in, and soon found himself sitting at the table, enjoying a meal of bread and ale. He got talking to William, and uh, he was interested to find out a little bit more about him. He asked him what he did for a living. And William said that he was a cobbler. He mended shoes for a living. Wanting to probe a little bit more, the king asked William, so what will happen to you when there are no shoes to repair? What if you have a, a difficult day? There's no money to put bread on the table. <sighs> said Michael, I don't tend to worry like that. You see, I'm a man of simple faith. Uh, my hands, my, my life is in the hands of the Lord Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. He watches over me. I can trust my life to him. All will be well. Now, this simple way of life for this creed um, annoyed the king. He felt slightly irritated by um, the reply that he'd received. And he decided on the spot that he would put this man's simple faith to the test. He left the house and went back to the palace. The next morning, when William went to ply his trade, he was surprised to see in the marketplace a sign. Henceforth, it is no longer lawful to mend shoes. If your shoes wear out, then buy new ones by order of the king. Oh, this is a curious message. William scratched his head and uh, took a moment just to be still, to remember, my life is in the hands of the Almighty. He watches over me, all will be well. When he'd come to the end of reciting his simple creed, he noticed at the other end of the market, um, there was a woman carrying a heavy water jar and she was clearly struggling without a moment's thought. He went to her assistance and helped her to carry the water. And when the water was at its destination, the woman pressed a coin into his hands and William looked down and then an idea struck him. Today, I will carry water for a living. And so he spent the day carrying water and other heavy objects. And by the end of the day, he had enough money to put a meal on the table. When the king came visiting again that night, dressed as a beggar, was welcomed in and was a little surprised to see on the table some bread and some cheese and some ale. They sat down to eat 
And the king asked William, how is it that you managed to furnish your table tonight? I, I noticed a sign in the marketplace that outlawed your occupation. Oh, yes, said Michael, said William, whose middle name was Michael. It's like this. Um, you see, I carried water for a living around the marketplace and I, I had enough money to buy the food that we now enjoy together. The king was a little annoyed and left that night deciding that he would test William further. The next day, William went to the marketplace to carry water and was somewhat perturbed that there was another sign next to the other, the one before, that said, henceforth, it is now illegal to carry water or other heavy objects, in brackets, for other people. Carry your own stuff, by order of the king. Hmm. Oh, this is a problem, thought William to himself, but remembered his creed, his life in God's hands. God watching over him, all would be well. Now, as he came to the end of reciting his creed, he looked across the market square and saw that the king's guard were recruiting soldiers. That's it, he thought. I'll be a soldier for the king. So he went and uh, was recruited and soon stood proudly in a beautiful uniform with a sword at his side. He did some soldiering for the day and at the end of the day he went to collect his pay. And I was a little dismayed, um, it has to be said, to discover that there was no pay at the end of the day, for the soldiers of the king were paid each month, and today was not payday, a full two weeks away. Oh, I thought, it's the end of the day, there's no time to do anything about this. But he remembered his creed. In the hands of God, all would be well. On his way home, he did have an idea. He went to the pawn shop, and he pawned the blade of his sword. He got a tidy sum for that, enough for two weeks of food, easily. He furnished his table with bread and cheese and grapes and a fine wine, awaiting his visitor as he knew he would come. But before that, he needed to do something else. He found some wood and fashioned a blade out of wood that would fill the sheath. There, he thought, I'm ready for tomorrow. Now the king came as he expected and was very surprised to see the bread and the cheese and the grapes and the fine wine on the table. He wanted to know what had happened. William told him everything. And by the end of that, the king knew that he had him. Now I have him, he said. Now we'll see how his simple faith fares. The next day, William went to the marketplace. Even as he approached in his soldier's uniform with the wooden sword concealed in the sheath, he saw a commotion. The king, the, 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 uh, the guard, the, the captain of the guard, saw William coming and he called him over. You, by order of the king. And it was true, for the king was there. You need to come and do your duty, young man. Draw your sword and cut off this man's hand. It was a terrible thing to hear. There on the ground was a, a, a man, a, a wretch of a man, who'd been caught stealing from the marketplace, a melon, for he was so hungry. He drew close. His heart was beating fast. He reminded himself as quickly as he could, my life is in God's hands. All will be well. Then he knew what he had to do. A crowd had assembled by this time and he looked up to heaven and he began to pray. Almighty God, help me to do my duty this day. Give me the strength I need to administer justice. You alone know the thoughts of a man's heart. You know whether this man is deserving of this punishment. If he deserves this terrible fate, then give me the strength I need to draw my sword and cut off his hand. But if, 
if he is not deserving of this, if you would show mercy, then I implore you by your power, turn this sword into wood. At this, he drew his sword. A gasp went up from the crowd. It's a miracle, it's a miracle. At that point, the king walked out of the crowd and looked straight in to William's eyes. Now dressed as a king, but as William looked, he recognised his friend. Do you know me? asked the king. Yes, I think I do, your majesty. These past days I have eaten at your table, said the king. From this time forward, you will always be welcome to dine at my table. For when you come, I would seek wisdom from you, that you should be a courtier and an advisor to me, for I would learn wisdom from you. And perhaps that simple faith that you carry, I will carry in my heart too. And perhaps it will make me wise for my rule. Let our praise be a welcome, let our songs be a sign, we are here for you, we are here for you. Let your breath come from heaven, fill our hearts with your life, we are here for you. We are here for you. To you our hearts are open, nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. You alone are holy, only you are worthy. God, let your fire fall down. Let our shout be your anthem. You're Skies. We are here for you. We are here for you. Let your word move in power. Let what's dead come to life. We are here for you. We are here for you. hearts are open, nothing here is hidden, you are our one desire, you alone are holy, only you are worthy, God let your fire fall down, to you our hearts are open. Darkness tries to hide and try. 
trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and oh see how great and how great is our God age to age he stands and time is in his hands beginning and the end beginning and the end the God had three in one oh he is Father, Spirit, Son the light I worship you, 
I'd like you to listen to a prayer from St Paul from the book of Romans, all about hope and peace and joy and faith. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Last week we thought about how taking a moment to be still and to know the God who holds our lives in his hands can can bring about uh, an energising of our of our faith which we then live out as we seek to give to others. The the little story that uh, I told you um, was just a, a way of imagining what that might look like in the everyday. I wonder how you got on with the story It's a charming tale of a simple trust and resourcefulness, I think. And I I wonder what you made of that stunt pulled right at the end. Clearly, the story doesn't tell the whole story about trust and faith. Sometimes life's problems are not so easily solved. Sometimes we need to live through difficult times, sadness, pain and suffering and things are not so quickly resolved. The life of faith um, is like that sometimes. Sometimes we pour out of our hearts the things we don't understand, the things that don't make sense. Is that still faith? Yes, it is. And let me prove that to you. Um, If we go to the book of Psalms, which is the songbook of the Jewish people, 150 Psalms, two thirds of which are laments, outpourings of sadness. There are many questions and complaints to God. This is all part of the language of faith, the journey of hope. In a moment, I'm going to read to you um, a few verses from some of the Psalms. 
and offer these as a prayer this morning. And I'm going to leave a, a few spaces in between the Psalms so that you can join your own prayers, the prayers of your heart to them. So let's take a moment now just to be still and then we'll hear these words from the Psalms and we'll pray together. Psalm 69. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in miry depths where there is no stronghold. I'm worn out, calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fail looking for my God. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you, I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. And Psalm 70 begins, Hasten, O God, to save me. Come quickly, Lord to help me. Lord, hear the prayers of our hearts. We have known loss and feel under threat there is sadness and sorrow in our days. Lord, hear our prayers and lead us to the rock that is higher than us. Amen. I'd like to introduce you now to Phil Hawkins, who is the um, pioneer of Apprendare, an educational charity that works in uh, many places in the world with some of the poorest communities. Apprendare works to bring hope and to build confidence. I'm going to hand to Phil right now. Hello, Book and Baptist. Uh, great to be virtually with you this morning. Uh, these are unusual times, aren't they? But I uh, just wanted to give you an update from the Hawkins household. Uh, Jill is on the mend. Thank you so much for your uh, lovely prayers and support and uh, love. Um, so gradually getting better. Evie also is getting better as well, um, but uh, we really, really appreciate your support. Okay. Now, the other thing is that the uh, International Mission Resource Team asked me to put something together to share with you about what Prenders are up to. So I'm uh, going to show you a video in a moment that will give you a bit of an overview, but just to let you know that obviously with the the travel um, restrictions happening. We're not going to be heading off anywhere soon. So we are actually doing a lot of work uh, virtually through conferences uh, via Zoom. And uh, the good news is that we've got a lot of content online uh, and that is proving to be really, really useful, getting really good feedback from that as well. So thanks for your support and prayers and now the video. One, two.
Take every treasure, take this life Everything's on the altar now No holding back, no holding there's our website um, for now that people have got a lot more time on their hands you can have a really good read of all the content that's on our website to give you a real good overview of, uh, of what we do all right thanks for listening guys god bless bye-bye thanks phil let's pray together when i uh, offer lord have mercy if you could respond hear our prayer lord have mercy Hear our prayer. Lord, we thank you for Phil and his team, for Apprender, for the sterling work that they're doing in the world. For the ways in which they work with some of the poorest communities in the world to build hope, to stir up confidence. Lord, at this time, we recognise that it's not possible for Phil and his team to be physically present in some of these places. But thank you for the creative means they found to, to help uh, build skills and to uh, facilitate learning. And we pray that you will strengthen them in, in this good work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Lord, we want to pray also for our teachers um, in this country who are also finding new ways to keep in touch with their students and to facilitate learning. We pray that you will be their strength. And as they come up to uh, the Easter break, that they'll be able to be renewed and refreshed before returning to this good work. Lord, help us to keep in mind those who are teaching our children and those who are known to us to bless and encourage them to find ways to be there and to support them. Maybe take a moment now just to name out loud teachers known to you and to think about how you'll support them in the days ahead. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I've forgotten where it happens next. Just check, Just check and then carry on, yeah. Um. Ah, it's giving, so we can we can do that as a fresh thing. Okay, let me do what I was going to do, and then you can think if there's. Yeah, we'll just do this. Sorry. We'll just do it like this. Okay. Okay. Just before Neil comes to uh, read the scriptures and to preach his sermon, um, we're going to take up our offering. Now, you're probably wondering how's that going to work. There won't be any offering bags coming round, of course. But we're going to take a, a moment to uh, think about what we are giving at this time um, and hold it before God together in the same moment. Now, I said there are no offering bags, but there are lots of ways to give. We've recently uh, begun to uh, experiment with an app called uh, Gift, G-I-V-T which is an app that you can download um, onto your phone or device and uh, enter your details. And it makes it very easy to, to give to a charity of your choosing, including Bookham Baptist Church. Um, put in your details. It takes care of, of gift aid and everything. And so that may be something that you already are doing or you'd like to do. And uh, if, you, if you want to, this could be the moment where you decide just to give an amount of money. M many of you, of course, give by, by standing order through, throughout the, the months and years. And we're really, really grateful for that. As we think about giving, uh, I'm conscious that for, for many of you, this is a time that's very difficult financially. There are others for whom um, it's possible to give a little more in response to the many needs around us. And I really want to encourage you to do that. As a church community, we're um, looking to respond to needs that are local and further afield. So um, if you'd like to give further support to that, please do. Finally, um, if you're um, among those who have done a little bit of stockpiling at this time, and it's been quite difficult to resist the urge to do that, you may find you're in a position to give out of your, your plenty. So with all of those thoughts together, I'd like to just invite you to just hold out your hands now like this. And just take a moment to think about what God has put in your hands to give at this time. I'm not just thinking about financial giving. I'm thinking about all kinds of giving. And let's hold these before God now and commit them to him. Father God, you have given us the means to give. And we ask that you help us to release to you and to others those things that are needed at this time. As a, as a community and as part of our worship, we offer to you our gifts. We pray that you will take them and use them. That your kingdom will come in the world. Your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. So the time has come to uh, invite Neil Casey to come to, to bring God's word to us. 
Uh, Neil is the CEO of Medair UK, uh, a relief organisation that is active in, in, these current, in our current situation, seeking to bring relief and help where it's needed. So Neil's going to come and preach. He's going to pick up the story of the Exodus, which is what we've been working through over these weeks. The people of God, the, the Jewish people rescued from slavery, brought through the Red Sea. And uh, Neil's going to pick up the story there and, um, and bring, bring the teaching this morning. So Neil, welcome. May the Lord bless you, inspire your hearts and open our hearts to, to listen to what God is saying. Amen. It's great to be with you as we continue our series looking at the book of Exodus. <clears throat> and we've arrived at Exodus chapter 15, uh, the place in the story where the Israelites have arrived at the edge of the desert. And we're going to have a look at a passage at the start of chapter 15, which is called A Song of Freedom. So we're in Exodus 15, verses 1 to 18. I'm going to read that. <clears throat> then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He is my God and I will praise him. My Father's God and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters have covered them. They sank to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shattered the enemy. The greatness of your majesty you threw down. In the greatness of your majesty you threw down those who opposed you. You unleashed your burning anger. It consumed them like stubble. By the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The surging waters stood firm like a wall. The deep waters congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy boasted, I will pursue. I will overtake them. I will divide the spoils. I will gorge myself on them. I will draw my sword and my hand will destroy them. But you blew with your breath and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who among the gods is like you, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? You stretched out your right hand and the earth swallowed them. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. The nations will hear and tremble. Anguish will grip the people of Philistia. The chiefs of Edom will be terrified. The leaders of Moab will be seized with trembling. The people of Canaan will melt away. Terror and dread will fall upon them. By the power of your arm, they will be still as a stone until your people pass by, O Lord, until the people you bought pass by. You will bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your inheritance, the place, O Lord, you made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, your hands established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. This is a song, a song of freedom, a song of worship. And the Israelites are singing this just after they've passed through the Red Sea. They arrive at the edge of the desert. Ahead of them lies hardship and uncertainty. Behind them lies the waters they've just passed through and the prospect of punishment and slavery. They can't go back, they can only go forward. And it's the start of a 40-year journey even, although they have no idea at this point how long this journey is going to last. This is not a great place, but, and it is an important but, it's the fulfilment of God's promise to his people. When we look back at the earlier chapters of Exodus, we can rem remember that time when Moses and God were in conversation at the burning bush, and God says this to Moses in verse in Exodus chapter 3, verse 12, he says, When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God. And we flick forward a little in the story, and we can remember those times when Pharaoh and Moses were in confrontation with one another. 
And in Exodus 7, verse 16, Moses says this to Pharaoh. He says, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to say to you, Let my people go, so that they may worship me in the wilderness. And here they are, in the wilderness, worshipping. The journey into hardship and uncertainty starts with worship. God's promises are fulfilled, and Moses and the Israelites begin their journey with worship. So, how do Moses and the Israelites go about worshipping God? Well, there are three things that um, have become apparent to me as I've read through this passage, and I want to draw those out for us. And the first is this. They make God real by describing who he is. They make God real by describing who he is. They describe God as highly exalted, a warrior, God of my ancestors, great, majestic, holy, as the God who reigns. And this brings God close. It makes God tangible. God becomes relatable. The distance between God and those who are worshipping him is short. Describing who God is makes God real. The second thing is this. The second element that they bring into their worship is that they bring a past event into their present. They bring a past event into their present. Now when we refer to the time when Moses and the Israelites escaped from Pharaoh and his armies, we describe it in six words. The crossing of the Red Sea. Now let's remember for a moment that for the Israelites, this event is now in the past, but let's look at how they talk about it. Verses 6 to 12 is where we find it, and they go into graphic detail. Their retelling of the events are a sensory experience full of sounds and smells and drama. There's hurling into the sea, the enemy is shattered, the waters are piled up and surging, deep waters congealed, there's boasting and destruction and God breathing his breath. The retelling of the story in this way makes the memory immediate and present. And as we read these words, we're in the action as if it's happening around us, not something that happened thousands of years ago. Now this way of remembering is the Israelites re-inhabiting a time when God showed up and God acted and God saved and God got them through. They're bringing into their worship a past event when God showed himself to be true and kept his promises. The third element of their worship that strikes me is this, is that they allow the events of the past to provide faith for their future. They allow the events of the past to provide faith for their future. And we see that in verses 13 to 18. This part of the passage starts with this statement, you will lead the people you have redeemed. Now we know that the Israelites face a 40-year journey into the promised land. And they know that to occupy that land and to call it their own, they're going to need to overcome those who live there. Remember in Exodus 3, God tells Moses that the Israelites will occupy the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. These guys are not going to go quietly or without a fight. So the Israelites know that there will be trouble ahead. And to overcome, they will require many conquests, just like the one that was needed to overcome Pharaoh. And they declare, referring to the armies of the land that they will one day call their own, they say this, they will be as still as stone until your people pass by. Now how are they able to say this with such confidence and certainty? And it's because they allow the events of the past, those events when God showed up and God acted and God saved, when God got them through, when God showed himself to be true and fulfilled his promises, they allow those events to cause faith to rise. Now we know when we read Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 that faith is being certain of what we hope for and confident of what we cannot see. Now, the Israelites couldn't see the promised land, but they were confident that they would get there 
because they allowed the events of the past, when God had showed up and saved them, to cause faith to rise in them. And they brought that into their worship. When I look at our situation at the moment, the things that we're facing at this time, and I read this passage and look at what's going on here with the Israelites, I can see a number of parallels. You see, we're in a new place. We're in our desert place. It's a place of difficulty and uncertainty. We don't know how long we're going to be here. We can't go back. We can only go forward. And we don't know how long our journey will be as we travel through. We don't know what else we may face along the way. But we do know that it's going to be different from what we're used to. It's going to be difficult and full of uncertainty. So how might we worship in this new desert place that we find ourselves in? Well, maybe we could take some pointers from Moses and the Israelites. As we enter this desert place and we, en- we bring our worship into that place, why don't we remind ourselves who God is? Let's bring him near so that the distance between him and those who are worshipping him is short. Let's take time to describe his characteristics, his personality, his very nature. Let me read you this. It's from Psalm 103, starting at verse 8. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbour his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. Now, if you want something to help you in your reminding of who God is, then look to the Psalms. Let me encourage you to bring the Psalms into your worship. In the rhythm of your day, maybe at a time that's easy to remember, like midday, take a moment to pause, to read, and to reflect upon one of the Psalms. Other things that we can bring into our worship at at this time is bringing the God of our past into our present. Let me ask you this. When did God show up for you? When did God act on your behalf? When did God get you through? When did God show himself to be true and fulfill his promises? When did God save? Let me encourage you at this time to go back and recall those moments. And don't just describe them in six words. Follow the example of the Israelites in how they remember. As an act of worship, let's revisit, reconnect, re-inhabit and remember. Now journaling may be a tool that could help you. It's something that I found helpful in drawing close to God, discovering his heart and his mind. Let me encourage you to take time to write down the events as you remember them. Where were you? What was happening in your life at the time? How did you feel? And ask the question, God, what were you doing in those moments? The third thing that we can bring into our worship at this time is that we can declare our future is certain because God is with us and let faith rise in us as a result. What was it that the Israelites said? You will lead the redeemed. We will cross this desert, however long it takes us, because God is with us. Allow faith to rise in us, because we have a God who leads us and who is with us. Now, what causes faith to come? Well, Paul, writing to the church in in, uh, his letter to the Romans, in chapter 10, verse 17, says this, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. In our worship, let's call out the promises of God. Let's draw upon the events of the past that we find in Scripture to cause faith to rise in us for our future. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, to give you hope and a future. Now those words were written at a time of exile, at a time of isolation. 
And we can look to the story of Job, someone who went through incredible suffering, but at the end of the story was restored. Paul, again, in his letter to the Romans, in uh, chapter 5, verse 6, reminds us that just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for us. Helping us to remember that Christ intervened on our behalf at a time when we were powerless to do anything about it. Christ died for us. And we're in this season of Lent, and it would be appropriate at this time, wouldn't it, to reflect upon Christ and his desert experience. We read in Luke chapter 4 how Christ, how Jesus, drew on the scriptures when he was in the, the desert, particularly the scriptures in Deuteronomy, to overcome and to prevail. So let's take time in scripture, searching out those promises of hope for the future, and allow the truth of those words to provide us with the certainty of our future. Because the God of the Israelites, of Job, of Jeremiah, of David the psalmist, of Paul who wrote that letter to the Romans, and God who was with Christ in the desert, is the God who is with us. Let me bring this to a close with one final thought. And it's, it's this. Who is it that is worshipping? Well, we read it, don't we, right at the very start of Exodus chapter 15. In verse 1, it says, Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. This is a communal activity. Everyone is included and everyone participates. And even though they're in the desert place, in the hard place, in the uncertain place, in the place full of difficulty and struggle, they worship. So let me exhort you to start this journey through our desert place with worship. And I can find no better words to finish than with those that we find in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, as they're recorded in the message. Let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging love, helping out, not avoiding worshipping together as some do, but spurring each other on, especially as we see the big day approaching. We're at the start of our journey into a desert place. We have to respect social distancing, which means we cannot meet physically. But as we take our first steps on the journey through our desert place together, looking forward to the promised land that, that awaits us, let us do so worshipping our God. And let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging love, helping out, not avoiding worshipping together as some do, but spurring each other on, especially as we see the big day approaching. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come. Longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, though the way things are. You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship Where it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it Where it's all about you It's all about you How much you deserve Though I'm weak and poor All I have is yours Every single breath I'll bring you more than a song For a 
song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, though the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. Oh, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. For it's all about you. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. For it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. For it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made. It's all about you, it's all about you, it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. Let's uh, pray together. Father God, thank you that you welcome the outpouring of our hearts. The, the sadness, the sorrow, the confusions, the, the longings, and our working toward you, moving towards you to find hope and to know your strength, to know your encouragement. Lord, we rest ourselves with you in your hands. going to end with a blessing returning to the words of St Paul in Romans chapter 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may be overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We've come to the end of our service. Thank you for joining with us. I hope to uh, see you again next time. The Lord bless you.